This is a introduction to the interpretation of the pediatric chest x-ray with a specific focus on a systematic approach. Now, what's different about children compared to adults? Well, besides the change in size that we see in the growth of this young girl, there's also a maturation of normal structures that are clearly evident in the pediatric chest x-ray. So we will look at the differences in growth and development uh, from the young child to the older child. For example, a two-month-old that presents with a large mediastinal mass that you can see through is a normal thymus. This is a classic ex example of what a normal thymus looks like in a two-year-old. In a seven-month-old, the thymus has become much smaller in proportion to the rest of the mediastinum in the chest. And by 16 years of age, it's very difficult to see a normal thymus. So if you see this type of thymic or anterior mediastinal enlargement as seen in this 16-year-old with neurofibromatosis, that is definitely abnormal. So we will start with a systematic approach by looking at the lung parenchyma, the pulmonary vasculature, airway and mediastinum, the heart, and finally at bony abnormalities. When we look at the lungs, we look at the density of the lungs and asymmetry of the lungs, and we need to consider a number of factors that affect lung density. And these are pulmonary inflation, the pulmonary vascularity, the lung parenchyma itself that may be abnormal, or the presence of pleural air or fluid. Here is a 14-month-old who presents with cough and wheezing. And on initial inspection, this chest x-ray looks like it represents a diffuse pneumonia with diffuse airspace disease. However, this is an underinflated chest. When we look at the number of posterior ribs that are within the inflated lung, we only count seven. Two minutes later, the chest x-ray was repeated, and we can see at now 10 ribs of inflation that this is a completely normal chest x-ray. A common fit pitfall in interpretation of children's x-rays is calling a hypoinflated chest a pneumonia. Here is another child who presents with nuanced wheezing or strider. And as we look at the lungs, we can see an asymmetry in lucency of the lungs with the left lung being more hyperinflated, more lucent and showing decreased pulmonary vascularity compared to the right side. In this situation, in this age group, we need to consider that there may be focal air trapping in the left lung in this child who aspirated a left bronchial foreign body. The asymmetry in pulmonary density can be a clue that there has been aspiration into a major bronchus. Another cause of hyperlucency or asymmetry in lucency in the pneumothora in the chest is the presence of a pneumothorax. Now, unlike adults, where the pneumothorax is often seen as a peripheral lucency, where the collapsed lung is more medially placed, in young infants who have stiff lungs and are on their backs, the pneumothorax typically presents, or often presents, as a medial lucency, and that may only be seen as a slight asymmetry in lucency of the two hemithoraces, but clearly more medial than one would expect. When we see a focal parenchymal change in density, we have to consider the possibility of pneumonia, as in this child where there is a dense, well-defined, rounded mass that seems to be in the retrocardiac region here. On the lateral, we can see that this mass is overlying the spine. This is a round pneumonia, which is a classic sign for bacterial 
pneumonia in children. Pneumonias tend to be well-defined and rounded much more commonly in children than in adults, and they may be misinterpreted as a pulmonary mass. Another child where the entire right lung is much denser than the left lung, and we can see that the trachea is displaced away from that dense lung, and that the medial, the lung on the right side only occupies the medial half of the right hemithorax. And this is because the lateral aspect of that hemithorax is occupied by a pleural effusion. When we look at the lateral, we can only see one hemithorax. And so this confirms the fact that there is m both parenchymal density and fluid. The next topic I'd like to talk about is the airway. We need to consider in the child the position, the caliber, and displacement of the airway. The normal airway in a child should be slightly to the right of midline because of the normal position of a left aortic arch. And on the lateral view, it, the trachea should have a nice gentle curve that mimics the curve of the spine posteriorly to it. What is very different in children compared to adults is that the trachea can markedly buckle during expiration, as in this child. We can see that the trachea is buckled almost at 90 degrees on the frontal view and clearly markedly buckled on the lateral view. This is entirely normal and is much more strikingly seen the younger the child. Now compare this trachea to a two-year-old who presents with new onset wheezing or strider. The first thing that we see is that the mediastinum in this child is much too wide for a two-year-old. At this age the thymus is much smaller and should not be so dense. In addition on the frontal view we can see that the air column of the trachea becomes less well-defined and more difficult to see as it courses down towards the carina. On the lateral view, we can see that there is marked anterior displacement and narrowing of the trachea by a mass that's pushing it from behind. And so we need to consider both normal structures and pathologic structures that normally live behind the trachea. And the, the most common organ that is there is the esophagus or lymph nodes. And again, this is a two-year-old who had rapid onset of respiratory difficulty. When we did an upper GI series, we saw that this uh, child had a an abscess with perforation of the esophagus because he had swallowed a small sharp piece of plastic. So as in the previous child where we saw aspiration of a foreign body, ingestion of a foreign body is also something that we need to be very attuned to in the young child. Here is a child who presents with wheezing as well. And on initial inspection, we see that there's slight asymmetry in the density of the lungs. But more importantly, we see that the trachea is not to the right of midline. It is slightly to the left of midline. And that the aortic arch is on the right side of the chest. This is very important to notice because many of these children with right aortic arch who present with strider will have a vascular ring. And on the CT scan, we can see a normal appearing tracheal diameter above the, the aortic arch. And at the level of the aortic arch, we can see a dramatic change in caliber caused by the aortic arch and the aberrant left subclavian coursing behind the esophagus. The mediastinum in a child is what really sets it apart from adults and it's the presence of thymus, and the fact that most adenopathy in children is not due to malignancy, 
but due to inflammatory conditions. Here is a two-year-old with cough, and we can see a very wide mediastinum, but if we look at it more carefully, we can see that the underlying lung is not atelectatic. We can see through this mass, and this mass fills the retrocardiac or retrosternal airspace. As we pay more attention to the left side of the chest, where the arrows are, these are where each anterior rib crosses the thymus. And you can see that there is a slight indentation of the thymus as it is crossed by the anterior ribs. This happens because the thymus is very soft and is displaced by normal structures and does not cause mass effect. Now I'm going to show four children with a right upper lobe opacity and show you how we can tell the difference between a normal thymus and other pathology. In the child on the left side of the screen, we can see a thymus that's well defined. It is not displacing the trachea. We can see through it and see normal lung parenchyma. This is a normal thymus. On the other hand, we have another child with a right upper lobe density where we can not see lung through it. Uh, we see a very well defined minor fissure below. This is a child with pneumonia. And if we compare them side to side, we can see the differences in density between the two. Here's another child, two children with right upper lobe opacity. The child on the right side of the screen, we see that the minor fissure is elevated and there is loss of volume with patchy atelectasis of the right upper lobe. We can also see that the trachea is shifted towards this abnormality rather than away in a child with atelectasis. The final child we see with a right upper lobe opacity not only has a very dense lesion in the right upper lobe, but there is no associated atelectasis. We can't see through the lung. And if you look at the trachea, it is being displaced away from this mass. This is a child who has neuroblastoma. And when looking at the heart, we have to describe the heart shadow as a cardiothymic silhouette, especially in young children, because the thymus can reach all the way down to the diaphragms. So we're not looking at just the heart, we're also looking at the thymus in addition to the heart. It's very difficult to describe specific chamber enlargement in young children because the size of the heart in proportion to the chest is relatively large and so one chamber enlargement can cause displacement of others. But I wanted to talk about the normal double atrial shadow. In this five-year-old, we can see that the left atrium appears as a rounded radio density behind the heart. In adults, this is a sign of left atrial enlargement, but in children, this is an entirely normal appearance of the left atrium. And the last area that we will cover is the skeletal system in the chest. We need to be aware of and look for fractures bony erosions and absence of specific bony structures that may represent either a syndrome or uh, erosion, complete erosion by a mass. Here is a nine-month-old who presented with a history of falling from her bed. And although on initial inspection, the chest x-ray looks normal in terms of heart size, mediastinum, the trachea, there is slight asymmetry in the pulmonary density, but it's really because of rotation. But when we focus on the ribs, especially on oblique views, we can see that there are multiple posterolateral rib fractures in this child. The presence of posterior and lateral rib fractures in an infant is highly suspicious for non-accidental trauma. Here's another
two-year-old who presents with irritability. And on initial inspection, the heart, the mediastinum, the lungs, and the overlying ribs look normal. But if we focus on the right 10th rib, we can see that its density is different than the surrounding ribs. On a more focused view, we can see that it has a moth-eaten appearance with patchy areas of lucency and density in this rib because it's being eroded and invaded by a neuroblastoma. So this system, systematic approach can be very useful in um, evaluating a pediatric chest, uh, especially if you look at each individual component as we've gone through. Final take-home points are to pay attention to pulmonary symmetry, look at the lung behind the heart because this is an area that can be often missed for pneumonias, look at the size and position and displacement of the trachea, when you're done with the main parts of the, of the chest, look at the bones and soft tissues because sometimes very abnormal and very significant things can be hidden there. And finally, if you have a question, ask for help. Thank you.